Okay, good morning to everybody. Uh, we're here in the uh, Chamber of Commerce Fellowship Hall. We're taking a, a little tour of heritage uh, pictures here of, in Cass County and Harrisonville. Right now we're in front of the picture of the Sharp Hopper uh, log cabin, which uh, was built in 1835. was dismantled uh, at the building site in uh, 1974 and moved into Harrisonville and uh, located uh, down on uh, the 400 block of Mechanic Street at what is now uh, the library and the information center. Uh, volunteers dismantled this on Labor Day of 74. Four, and uh, we had the idea of marking all the logs with a wood block and a permanent marker. And uh, there was a fellow from Independence, Missouri, said that we couldn't do that. We had to put three by five cards on them uh, so we wouldn't have a nail hole in the logs. The cabin, uh, of course, this picture shows it with a wood roof on it, which was uh, hand split, uh, hand split shingle oak. Uh, originally and uh, it did not have uh, any siding on it originally it, just as you see it here in the picture. Uh, we got it put together and uh, about the time that we got it done why that's when they decided to have a historical festival and they called it the Log Cabin Festival here in Harrisonville and uh, in those days why the Cabin Festival had uh, Chautauqua tent. We had acts come in for that. It was a three-day event, people coming in making homemade soap, uh, making apple butter, all the things you do uh, in that time period. But uh, the brick fireplaces, the uh, Brown Plantation House was built about the same time this was with brick, and they had some excess brick. We were gifted these brick from that old ruin. So. But outside of that, why the cabin is a reference point for people who visit Harrisonville and a, a great conversation piece if you uh, stop and think that what few tools these people had to work with to put that together. Anyhow, this was the frontier. This picture here is a picture of the Burnt District Monument, which is located out at the Justice Center on two highways. This was built uh, in 06. I had a little bit to do with it, kind of helped get the design, made the forms for the fireplace, and uh, retrieved the stone. The stone came uh, off of a uh, subdivision here in Harrisonville uh, that was uh, originally uh, owned by the Younger family. Charlie Younger came here prior to this being a county and homesteaded on some ground here in Harrisonville. We thought that we had a, a great design and uh, anyhow, uh, it had been up only a few months and lightning hit the corner up here and blew the whole corner off of it and blew stone for 150 feet in all directions. Uh, we had a fellow come by while we was building it and he said, well, one thing about it, you won't have to worry about it blowing away. Well, none of us thought about lightning in it. You'll see the benches here. These are stone that came out of the 1870 jail that was located uh, down here on the 200 block of West Pearl Street. The jails they had was burnt down by the red legs that came over from Kansas. And uh, after the Civil War, why, there was a contract let to build a jail. And the jail was, uh, took the jail down in uh, 1960, and that stone was taken over to Lake Luna and used as riprap. The county uh, permitted us to locate that on county property, which we was most grateful for, and uh, we have a marquee out there explaining several different things. So invite anybody that has spare time to go out by and uh, take a look at that and uh, think a little bit about the history of this county. This picture is the monuments over Memorial Field. 
Memorial Field was constructed in 19, dedicated in 1950. We'll have more story when we get to another portion of it. But this is the original monument and this is the bronze plaque that calls it uh, Memorial Field. Uh, I was at a worship service about 10, 12 years ago and somebody asked uh, uh, about on Memorial Day and if anybody had any thoughts. And I had some thoughts about the fact that I went to Harrisonville High School and was part of building the field, but I never did know who the men were that gave their lives during World War II. Anyhow, a lady uh, heard me speak. Uh, she was a hairdresser at uh, Fantastic Sam's on 291 North. And uh, about four weeks later, she sent her tips in to me and with a note said, John, this is not much money, but this will get you started. And it was $12.04. I started a fundraiser to get the tablets of stone. Some of these men, as a young lad, I knew. As a young guy, when World War II started, I had just turned six years old. And I recall folks coming to our house to tell us that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And my dad said, well, where in the world is Pearl Harbor? And the next day at Rockford School, uh, the community, some of the community gathered there to look at the globe to figure out where Pearl Harbor was and to figure out where Japan was on the globe. This man is buried down at Burford Cemetery and as a sexton down there for several years, I moved over his grave. Paul Miller. Paul was uh, uh, a farm boy over by Cleveland. His brother lived next door on the farm to where I grew up. And, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Paul was a gunner on a B-29 uh, flying fortress and that plane was shot down. Another one was uh, Edwin Monroe. Edwin uh, was the son of a pastor here in Harrisonville of the First Baptist Church. Uh, he was his chaplain in the army and a fragment from a mortar hit him and killed him, took his life. And that was a sad, sad time for this community to lose uh, a pastor's son that was a chaplain. And uh, in those days, uh, if you lost a loved one, if you lost a son in the military, in the war, why, well, there was a gold star banner hung in your window. And as a lad, I remembered riding down South Independence Street with my parents and seeing that gold star hanging in the window. The blackened tablets here, that's 52 inches high and 24 inches wide, was set in 2008 dedicated in October. We started the project of putting the names together through the Historical Society in 2006. And uh, it took the ladies about two years to get it together and then we had to have a fundraising to get the uh, black uh, granite in order to put the na 90 names on that. I don't know why I was led, uh, but I felt like it ought to be on black granite and at that time where the main source for black granite was from India. So these stones are uh, 52 inches high, two foot wide, and on a major base, and uh, 30 names on each stone. And uh, we had to raise about $4,500 uh, for the project. It originally sat on the north end of the football field, and when the football field was remodeled, in the early 2000s, why we marked these stones and relocated them and put them here and brought this brass uh, tablet uh, with it. As you notice that it was erected in 1950. I'm humbled to say that that was the easiest fundraising project I ever had. It was just great. People would stop me, give me $20 bills. Uh, they was large gifts. It was just a great experience. So anyhow, uh, if you visit Memorial Field, why uh, go by the monument and uh, you'll have an idea of uh, what the sacrifice was so we can get a football field. Uh, 
this is uh, an 1830s building. Uh, it was built mostly with slave help. Uh, the bricks were made on the farm. The sandstone foundation really don't know for sure where it was quarried, but uh, we think it was quarried near the farm so they could drag it up with horses or mules or whatever. This is a slave quarters. There's no way you can explain how moving it is to visit those slave quarters. Uh, you don't notice there's fireplaces. These are back to back. There's four. And this, this was a quarters for the household. The field hands had separate cabins out on the field. So the field hands were not with the domestic workers. Uh, there's several stories that goes with this. Uh, writers came up, they shot at Mr. Brown. There's a bullet hole still in part of the woodwork inside the, uh, inside the building there. Uh, this is the carriage house uh, where uh, they kept the carriage and uh, the horse. When I was first started in the construction industry in the mid 50s, I was sent out here to help rebuild some of this, and I got to know the lady that lived there. She was a descendant of the Brown family. Her name was Agnes Brown. Uh, she uh, later married uh, in, in her older years to Sid Hamilton, which was Brutus Hamilton's uh, uh, brother. Uh, Brutus, of course, is the Olympic star that's in our track at Memorial Field is named after him. This house was uh, a gathering point during the Civil War. Uh, there was a dance being held here at this house and uh, uh, one of the Kansas uh, soldiers uh, uh, challenged uh, Cole Younger. He wanted to dance with Cole's sister and anyhow, there was a dispute. Uh, supposedly Cole went through a window and he escaped after some gunfire. Uh, it was known as the Maccabee House and later on why uh, a fellow by the name of Davis bought this house at in the late 80s early 90s of 1800 and he built these concrete piers and put this porch out on the front of it and uh, it, it amazes me that these are still in reasonably good shape. I have been in that house a time or two. Uh, I do not know much history on it. Uh, I know later families had added onto the back of the house and had put this porch on. But that, uh, uh, an interesting house and it's one of the, probably the oldest house other than the log cabin we've seen at the beginning here. Probably the oldest house standing in Harrison Jones out on Price Street at the end of of uh, East Pearl Street. Now the wreath that was at the moving Vietnam Wall that we done in the last few days of June and early July of 2019, uh, this is all the names of the men that would sacrifice their lives in Vietnam. I'm not absolutely sure how I got involved in it other than the fact I was invited to a meeting by Ed Roberts. Uh, Ed was a a prime mover in trying to get this organized and I took on the responsibility of uh, preparing the site and doing the sidewalks and so forth. Ed approached the lady that owns the flower shop next door here for a wreath and uh, she said sure. And uh, as I understand, and this may be erroneous, but I understand that she handmade this wreath and uh, it is still being used yet today as Memorial Day and on Veterans Day at different ceremonies here in Harrisonville. Estimate of the crowd was about 36,000 folks. It was a four day event. One of the most moving things of that, of course, for me, and the Native American came by with a smudge pot of some sort and a feathers of the hawk wing and he went along and he blew smoke on all of those. And uh, that, that was soul stirring to me to think that a Native American uh, appreciated and honored this. Uh, it was just one of those once in a lifetime things you see and you really don't know. Uh, I didn't visit with a man. I don't know where he was from, but it was soul stirring.
This is a 1917 picture. And this is the men that was gathered right over here on the southwest corner of the square. And these men, there uh, was a hundred and some of them been sworn in to go to Camp Funston, Kansas for basic training for World War One. This man right here is the man that came over and swore those men in to the United States Army. After the swearing in ceremony, they were marched down Wall Street to the First Baptist Church where the ladies had prepared a meal for them, had their meal, and they were marched down to the railroad tracks, put on cars, and taken to Camp Fudson. Now, there was 53 men that lost their lives in World War I. Of those men here, five of their names is on this. It's 53. So five of our Cass County boys did not make it home. Of the 53 names on there, of Cass County men, only 25 were battle casualties. 26 were Spanish flu casualties. A pandemic that went through the nation, an estimated 650,000 people. And now we are at about 550,000 with the pandemic we've got going on now. So the more times change, the more they don't change. Uh, we were ill prepared for a pandemic and I hope there's a lesson on this. Let's talk a little bit about this. You see the cars, Cars were just coming in, to, and the city council of Harrisonville had a major problem. They still had horses. So in order to combat that, they put the cars on the south side of the square and on the north side of the square. You see horses over here on the east side and horses here on the, the west side. And, of course, most of them are hooked up to buggies. It looks like maybe one is horseback. Another thing to observe is... Your Red Cross nurses, they were volunteers, but they were here for this swearing in ceremony. There's a lot of things here to see. This is the uh, Deacon uh, Hardware building that is now the law office. Uh, uh, this building being remodeled. Anyhow, a lot of interesting things. And the wall around the courthouse was not put in until uh, 1935. The brick, which does not show up on this computer uh, enhanced picture. This was a black and white picture. And uh, this lady up here is the one who took that and put it on the computer and got it colorized for us. And then Bennett Symes is the one that reproduced it for us. And we got it on the plaque. This is um, Memorial Field here at what was the Harrisonville High School and now is the middle school. When I came into town in 1949 to go to school, I, uh, I was a product of a tenant farmer and a sharecropper. My parents never did own a farm. And uh, anyhow, I uh, had went to Rockford School and graduated there and came in and uh, they started talking about football. I'd never seen a football. I didn't know what football was when uh, uh, the school that uh, we was at was on the hilltop and of course we had uh, played uh, Annie I over and uh, that was about it. I uh, was a student here in Harrisonville in 1949 when the school board uh, bought this 20 acres of ground that Memorial Field is located on. A group of men called the Downtown Quarterback Club was the ones that got the idea that we ought to have a new football field. They was a group of men that sold farm implements, liked the idea, so they joined them. Well, if you're going to be part of the team, so are we, said the American Legion and the BFW. So those men got together and they started grading this field in, in early spring of 1950. I was a freshman here at that time. At that time, when they got it graded in, they started pouring a concrete for the concrete bleachers that would hold about 300 people. And they took several of us young farm boys out of study hall to come down and shovel gra uh, gravel and sand and, uh, and wheel the concrete to the farms for the guys. So uh, I can say that I helped build 
Memorial Field, 1951, uh, I uh, was on the football team. I was a junior. The highlight of my football career was scoring a touchdown against the Roosters. But that's another story. Then in 1984, why, uh, we rebuilt the track and uh, dedicated it to uh, Brutus Hamilton which the field is named after, and at the north end of the field where the flagpoles are and so forth is a, is a dedicated bronze plaque to Brutus. Monument that was erected here in, if my memory serves me right, in uh, 1988. There was a group of men that decided that the track ought to be uh, regraded, uh, drained, uh, paved in such a way that we can be competitive in, uh, with other schools. So the track was rebuilt and uh, the dedication of the track was in the spring of 88. Uh, Brutus Hamilton was a student here at Harrisonville High School and was an Olympic participant in the decathlon, if I remember correctly, was a medal winner. Up to now, why, he's the only individual that we uh, have had uh, in the school system that was in the Olympic. And uh, it is an honor to uh, have been a part of rebuilding this track and knowing this track is named after him. And you'll probably notice the flag poles with all the flags on it. Uh, it's some of the accomplishments of the students here at the school system. A little later on, there was uh, financial uh, benefits to when the uh, distribution center located in the south side of Harrisonville, and those benefits were used to put carpet on the field and to build the stadium as we see it now. It's something for this community to be proud of, not only for the football team, but for the soccer and for the track team and all of those who use the field. The track is used by our citizens as an exercise path. There have been a lot of young men and women that will have fond memories for many years that uh, worked on that field and uh, played on that field. And I uh, have been able to attend football games there every year since it was built. Since 1950. And uh, I'm not very good at math, but I can't figure out whether I've been going uh, 70 years or 71 years. Anyhow, it's been a real journey, real journey for me and a pleasure to be a part of that. I happened to be too skinny to play on the football team as a sophomore, but on my junior and senior year, why well, I played with the Wildcats. Uh, the junior year, we played in the Mineral Water Bowl game. If you'll ask any survivor of that era, we all remember that. Coldest day that we can any of us remember. Teammate and I, we felt like we had the most important job on the team at that time. We had to keep the water can from freezing up. And uh, anyhow, then the second year, our senior year, we had a postseason game with El Loretta Springs. And I have been told that uh, postseason games and uh, bowls uh, were uh, eliminated from that time until they started the regular playoff things now. And the playoff games, of course, Harrisonville has had a good record in that, and we're proud of the Wildcats. I remember the very first game when uh, the quarterback of the club uh, caught a kickoff over on the far side on about the uh, five yard line and ran it all the way back for a touchdown. Uh, we really felt like we was initiating the field the right way. We never did have uh, bleachers for guests on the opposite side of the field until this year. and. Uh, if you're patient and you're willing to wait long enough and uh, uh, think about things and anyhow it only takes about 71 years to get a project done. About four weeks ago um, I asked what the plans were for a ticket booth and, and concession stand for, the, for our guest of honor who come and, uh, with the op opposing team and they had been no plans. I happened to have this building on hand, so I gave it to the Booster Club to convert into a big uh, booth concession stand. Proud that I was able to help the Wildcats out. Back in 1949, uh, when I come to school, why that was the football field where the parking lot is. And uh, the track uh, was the cinders. The cinders came out of the boiler room where the steam heat was generated to heat the school. Out to the left side, and looking to pass is Bird. He throws it over the middle, a touchdown, Nick Laughlin! 
when they first started organized football, why uh, pads were scarce, the things developed as the game developed. And uh, when I first started playing football in 1951, we had leather helmets. Uh, plastic helmets was for the first team. We bought 11 for the first team, and then the next year they was able to buy plastic helmets for the rest of the boys. So. Uh, you'll see the building next to Memorial Stadium is the first gymnasium that was built in, uh, uh, in the late 50s uh, uh, that uh, kind of met uh, graphic standards. Uh, the stadium we had, uh, or the gymnasium we had before, had uh, beams that were, well anyhow you would hit the beam sometimes when you passed the basketball. Uh, so. So the, uh, anyhow, the, the new gym uh, in the 50s was a great improvement for everybody. I uh, recall several different bond issues that uh, we took, uh, but before we built the center school and remodeled it for the last time, it took five issues before the public agreed to, to tear down the old buildings and put up the new. And uh, I have no idea what the enrollment is. Uh, I assume the enrollment of the high school is around 2,200 to 2,500, but I don't know that. I do know the new census is out, and the city of Harrisonville grew less than 100 people in 10 years, which is a shame, but that happens in life. So. We got jumbled. Uh, one of the fans of the Harrisonville uh, group, as I understand it, um, uh, definitely a wildcat supporter to invest that kind of money into something. And it certainly is, uh, at game time, a pleasure to see that and to hear it go. One thing we haven't talked about is the blessing that Kevin Thomas has been as a wildcat announcer. I'm a 1983 graduate of Harrisonville High School. Um, I graduated from Central Missouri, what was then Central Missouri State in 1988. I got my uh, major in broadcasting film, minor in speech communication. Very involved in campus, returning the lock, the whole deal. Uh, went to work, worked in Kansas City, worked for YRC Freight. And uh, as far as, you know, something being a part of the Wildcat Nation, I, I think every Friday night that um, they allow me the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to voice for the cats, I think, that's, I think that's a super thing. I think that's the main thing that sticks out to me as far as being a Wildcat. I was, uh, I did 8th grade freshman and JV football for 10 years before they afforded me the opportunity to do varsity football. So I believe this is either the 15th or 16th year for varsity. I did 8th grade freshman and eighth, eighth grade uh, freshman and JV for 10 years prior to that. So this is what, the 25th, 26th year? And before that, I was uh, the voice for the uh, Cass County Junior Athletic Association. I believe that I did that for three years. In 2004, there was a Class 3 semifinal game here. And it was the loudest I ever heard this stadium. And that was the last year that Harrisonville Memorial Stadium had natural grass. And, and uh, it was very muddy. It was, it was ridiculously muddy. And, and uh, the following year we got AstroTurf, but it, or this field turf. But I remember this stadium being so loud when it was when it was the fourth quarter and Maryville Sleuth Hounds had great players. And one of their players, linebacker, I believe he wanted to become Division II Player of the Year and play for the Northwest uh, Bearcats. And the stadium was so loud. And, and Harrison was always supported their football, but back in those days, and I would love to see it get back to that again, it was absolutely ridiculous, Macy, how loud the stadium was. People were stomping, screaming on that final drive. And I'm, I firmly believe, I think that I think the Maryville kid threw an incomplete pass, and I, don't, I know darn good and well that the noise had something to do with it. Every Friday night that I'm able to come up here, you know, health permitting, and the Booster Club, whatever allows me to do this, and the, the community does, you know, I guess could yank it at any time, you know, so I'm at their disposal. I, I guess that's that's the best part of it, is, is every every Friday night I'm able to come up here, and it's a blast to do. It's really a blast. I guess when the time comes, everything comes to an end. Everyone has to retire, unfortunately. Um, I don't know for sure when that time's going to be, but as for right now, I thoroughly enjoy coming here, as I have for the last 25 years, and, and uh, Doing this. But he does an excellent job uh, of cheering us and leading us on.